you can hear it. Hello and welcome to this presentation of the fiscal year 2022 recommended budget. I'm Jeff Richardson, Albemarle County Executive, and I'll be walking you through our recommended budget today. This year's budget theme pulls forward the budget theme from fiscal year 2021, which was respond, recover, recalibrate. The fiscal year 21 budget was a budget in flux. We just didn't know a lot about what last April and May was about, and as well as the next 15 months. So therefore, we had to take a very cautious approach to build our budget using the best information that we had. We've added to that theme for fiscal year 22, the word resilient, because this recommended budget is designed to make strategic investments to transform our organization and our community, to make structural changes and alignments that ensure that we're focusing our resources in the right places. As always, our revenue recommendations are guided by our strategic plan, the initiatives which are shown here. The bottom bar that underpins the work of the strategic plan, quality government operations. That fuels our organizational capacity to advance the strategic plan priorities by investing in a quality workforce and managing our, our financial foundation in a way that sets us up for future success. Along with that, in 2020, we expanded the organization's core values. It now includes community. That means we expect diversity, equity, and inclusion to be integrated into how we live our mission. Our work ahead is to realize this value and develop tools and the training to empower our staff to integrate equity into all the work we do. I believe that thread begins to run through this budget. I believe this past year has demonstrated maybe more than any other year the critical role that broadband plays in our lives. It's almost like electricity and water. Earlier this year, the Board of Supervisors approved establishing a broadband affordability and access program using strategic reserve funding. For this coming year, we will, we will continue to support that with additional staffing and ongoing money so that we can address our community needs. In addition, we will also uh, work with our housing policy with investment because our ho housing policy continues to work toward final editing. We want to put one-time one money, $600,000, into the affordable housing fund to support the housing needs of our community. 1.7 million of our fund has already been previously committed to the Habitat for Humanity Southwood project. Also, there is 1.94 million that remains in the fund for other opportunities that will be identified later. Our board recently adopted a climate action plan. This coming recommended budget identifies one-time funding for project implementation. Also, the upcoming budget uh, invest in transit. Our budget will support the regional transit vision work that will set a roadmap for the transit future. Our community continues to grow and to keep up with these mandates and community priorities, it requires us to invest in our built environment. We've done that in fiscal year 21. We intend to do that going into fiscal year 22. We have been able to, in our capital budget, strategic investments to keep moving forward to ensure that we have the capacity and the equipment to maintain the community's quality of life. Based on the recommendations of our CIP advisory committee, this budget supports the construction of our courts project. We've also set aside funding for transportation leveraging, economic development, public-private partnerships. We will continue to invest in our schools. It's planned expansions at Crozet Mountain View Elementary. Both of these will address system capacity constraints. We'll also continue to invest in our parks and trails, notably the opening of Biscuit Run Park. This budget also continues to invest in the Registrar's Office, early voting for primary and election support. We experienced high volumes of customers over this past year, and this probably will continue. In addition, our comprehensive plan, which is the guiding document for one of our busiest policy areas, land use. Also, the state budget is currently supporting the full cost of two family preservation positions within social services at no cost in our FY22 budget. This budget also supports the needs of our regional partners, our nonprofits, the arts and cultural institutions, 
all of which meet so many of the human service needs in our community. And it also invests in our public safety function. North Garden Volunteer Fire Department is requesting career staff to support weekday daytime coverage. I, I, they are facing similar challenges that we faced a year ago in the Crozet community. This request would take five positions to support, as well as one-time funding to purchase a new ambulance. This budget has also recommended the addition of one additional staff person in our fire rescue training division to address capacity challenges due to increased personnel over the past several years. Within our police department, there has been a shift in how the school division will su provide security, and this will create capacity for how our five officers spend their time with a new investment by local government for the equivalent of about two and a half officers, we will be gaining 5,000 hours of experienced patrol time that will be invested uh, throughout Albemarle County. This will support our geo policing work and better connect us with our community and it will enhance our public safety profile. Last year, we originally had recommended implementation of $15 an hour across the board for full and part-time staff, as well as a 2% market adjustment for all county staff. All of this had to be deferred once the pandemic hit. I'm pleased that this year that we've been able to put this back into the FY22 recommended budget, but the implementation of $15 an hour, as well as the 2% market adjustment. In addition to that, I want to continue our multi-year investment with our systems alignment and process improvement work, both inside the organization, as well as with some of our external facing departments. We will begin to scope a new enterprise resource planning effort. This includes the replacement of the county view system, which is in our community development department. I'm excited about this because this will allow us to be uh, more responsive to our citizen needs over the course of time. We still find ourselves very much in the throes of the pandemic. We, we have approached the one year mark. Fiscal year 21 and fiscal year 22 are linked much more tightly than we may have seen in recent years. I'll take a few minutes walking through the fiscal drivers of the budget. We believe that during the course of this coming year, our economy will continue to stabilize. We are going to continue to know a lot more about the long-term impact of the pandemic on our economy, on customer service expectations of the public, and the way we work. The approach for physical year 22 is that it's a year of transition. We believe that the investments we make now will make us more strong and resilient in the future. We start our budgets every year by taking a hard look at our diagnostics. How are we doing? For the past several years, it's been good news pretty much across the board with uh, assessments, business activity, consumer spending, and building activity. This year, assessments continue to grow on the residential side and residential building activity is strong. Commercial real estate assessments are down five and a half percent. There are other areas in the community that are really struggling. For an example, SNAP applications year over year are up 34%. You may know that this is a federal program for food assistance based on income eligibility. In addition, our tourism and hospitality industry, due to travel and gathering restrictions, have been deeply impacted. Year over year hotel room occupancy rates are down 35%. These businesses generate consumer activity and they also supply many local jobs. Finally, our financial management policies, our planning, our conservative and flexible approach over the last 15 months has continued to allow us to judiciously guard our triple triple A bond rating. We are financially very, very strong. The recommended F FY22 budget is balanced at just over $466 million. This is an 85.4 cent tax rate and that's the same tax rate as this present year. We are not recommending a tax rate going into fiscal year 22. This chart provides an overview of where our revenues are coming in from. And this chart provides us uh, an overview of where our expenditures are going. This is a position change summary. I've mentioned the six firefighters and training position in ACFR. I've mentioned the additional investment in broadband, as well as the state supported family support positions at DSS. 
I will also point out the 19 frozen positions across county government. That's about 39,000 hours of time that is being held as we continue to monitor our economy, we continue to monitor our workloads, and this hopefully will better position us through fiscal year 22 to continue to make necessary adjustments. Here's the budget development timeline for this year, moving toward a final public hearing on April 28th, the adoption of the budget on May the 5th. All meeting information is posted on our website and all meetings will be held virtually and in compliance with local and state ordinances. And finally, here's contact information. If you have questions, if you have comments that you would like to share, as always, we would love to hear from you. And I really want to take a minute to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for participating in county government. All right, and we've had several folks join. Welcome, everybody. We just wrapped up a video um, introducing the fiscal year 2022 budget. And um, uh, Supervisor Galloway, how would you like to work through um, Q&A? Uh, we can do, I mean, there's not that many people. I, I'm happy that if they, uh, if you're interested in asking a question, you can use the raise your hand feature. There's also a place there where you can put in the Q&A. Um, you can type a question in. Um, so I'm happy to either call on a raised hand and hear the question, or if you wish to have it typed in, I'll address, address it that way. Great. Uh, and I see um, Mr. and Mrs. Schlussel has their hand raised. If you are um, joining on Zoom for the first time um, and you hover over the bottom of your screen, um, you will see an opportunity to raise or cl click a button to raise your hand. Um, and if you are participating by phone, it's star nine. Great. Kent and or Judy. Hello, can you? You there, Judy? If you're talk if you're talking, we cannot hear you. It's coming through very your voice is coming through very digitized. We can't understand you. You may want to type your question in if that's possible. On our end, it sounds similar to when um, um, sometimes we have an issue at a board meeting um, and then you, sometimes you switch computers. Looks like they logged out and are going to try to log in. Does anyone else wish to ask a question either by raise of hand or typing into the Q&A? There's Kent and Judy back. While we're waiting for them to get hooked up, I will say that I received a um, an emailed question from a Rio District resident who I thought might be on the call tonight. Um, but uh, Gary Grant of Earliesville had asked us or asked me today about the current fiscal year 22 budget um, is 17.4% higher than the current budget. Um, and he wanted to make sure that he had that number right because he, he believes um, that it is quite a percentage higher than what the current budget is. But his question was, are you willing to mention this figure prominently at your March 29th budget work session and explain why, in my view, it is high so that taxpayers hears this enormous increase loudly and clearly prior to the April 28th public hearing on the fiscal year 22 budget? So I think giving that the first question at this point is um, gives it some prominence. My initial response when I read that question was that I'm guessing that that's due to the fact that we froze and did a lot of changes to the current budget due to the pandemic. Um, so being that that is, um, we went back and redid that and kind of constricted or confined it back. And now with CARES funding coming through and the budget moving forward, we're, um, the size of the budget may be, be in fact larger. Lori, is my thinking right on that as to why? I hate to put you on the spot, but. Um, oh, no problem. Um, I'm Lori Allshouse. I'm the uh, Assistant uh, Chief Financial Officer for Policy and Partnerships. I think Mr. Grant is um, 
looking at a page in our document on page 25. And um, interesting thing about budgeting uh, in local government is we have this thing called total fund uh, where we have to show every single thing, um, all the funds that we run in the county. And when you look at that, a couple of the funds are what we call debt service funds, capital funds, you know, so there's different funds that are in there and, and they're just due to timing. So for example, if you have a capital project, you put funding in one year and then the next year, not as much or more, um, that affects this total fund. So there's some very specific areas, um, uh, Chair Galloway, of, of just timing and things around capital and debt that, that caused the primary, the primary uh, changes in that percentage. Make it that significant. I mean, I would imagine that it's a little, you know, it's higher anyway compared to it, but or would have been. But understood. Thank you for that um, for that answer. Kent, Judy, are you okay? Can you hear us? Now? Oh, so much better. Good oh, oh, success. Okay. <laughs> Very first thing. Thank you so much for making all the arrangements to have uh, this meeting. I really appreciate it. Um, so moving forward, uh, two questions. One is uh, somewhat budget related. The other one is not. I'll start with the one that's not. Um, as you probably have seen, when you make the left turn into onto Dunlora Drive and Dunlora Park is on the right, for ages we've seen at least one fire hydrant and many culverts there. Uh, I think anticipating for Dunlora Park to go into phase two. Is there anything that we can do to move all those, that equipment? Because it could be a while before they actually start breaking ground to build the townhouses. So you're talking up on the, like the, the uh, concrete and um, you're, if you're coming from uh, Penn Park, you're we're turning right in and it's right there on the corner? Correct. Yeah, across from the uh, metal flowers. Yeah, um, I'll check into this again, Judy. This has come up before from another Dunlora resident. Okay. Um, and I'll have to go, I can track it because I know who did that. And I do know that I raised this before and I'll see what the response is because that, if memory serves, that's been a little bit. So um, if the purse, whatever the change, because of course that's up to the developer, I believe, to, to handle that. Um, but let me look into that again and see what the response was when I checked on it again. And I'll, if I have to run it up the flagpole again, we'll see what see what I can learn. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, the um, other item was at the CAC meeting. Um, you were asked about the some additional money for the remainder of the Rio quarter study, and you said stay tuned. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so. Today, during our budget work session at three o'clock, one of the items that was brought up for expense for uh, using either board reserve that this particular project would come from board reserve and correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff or Lori, but this came up to the board because the to get the other additional piece of Rio Road uh, from Warner down to the city line included based on um, what the consultant scoped and the consultant didn't this consultant did what he was asked to do. Um, so the error is not there, but to uh, continue that study and include the Eastern portion of Rio Road into the scope is gonna take some additional funds. So this was the first time the rest of the board heard of those additional funds and nobody stood in objection to that. The intent is to include it into the current study with the current consultant and get it all done in one fell swoop along with the other section there's of course savings doing it that way versus finishing the one study to the Warner and then doing a whole nother second study on the Eastern side. So the time frame of it will get included into the study. Um, I think the, the extra funding, if, if, one, if it is approved, um, I say if, but like I said, nobody was objecting, would be in, uh, come into Monday, uh, May, I'm sorry. And then the, um, the project and the results of that additional leg of, the, of Rio will be included in the full study. Um, so once it's all complete, we will have a true corridor study from Rio uh, from 29 all the way down to the city line. Um, so again, I didn't hear any objections today. In fact, most folks mentioned it when they were uh, citing support. 
Um, so in my mind, that I mean, it's not voted on. The funds haven't been approved, but it sounds like it'll be a done deal and we'll get the whole corridor study done as it was originally envisioned. Oh, that's such good news. Thank you so much. My turn. How's <laughs> oh, that, Kent? Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. I have a question about the voting support that was in the video. I know last year as an election official, the county spent a lot of money because for early voting, we had, um, I don't know, about 17 people every day uh, for early voting, 16 or 17, 18 people, something like that. And yeah, we were paid $14 an hour. Uh, and we were able to use the county office building because nobody else was there. But you know, come November, I don't know when the county's gonna go back to work in the uh, office building, this is a building on Fifth Street. Yeah. Are there funds there to have another place for us to vote and to support all those people? Cause I think the state legislation, I, I don't know if the governor signed or not, is demanding 45 day early voting thing now if I'm correct, which is, to me, is a long time. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, to, uh, memory serves, I can't remember if this came up in a board meeting or if I had a separate conversation about this. Um, but I believe one of the things, now this is me positing a, a, a guess based on this conversation, and Jeff Richardson is on the call, so he'll correct me or add to what I'm about to say. The biggest staffing out there, of course, in addition to the, the police department are the Department of Social Services, who have been part of the reason we were able to house them out there is because of all the work from home that was going on. And I believe they're going to be able to continue those work from home pieces. So um, I don't, if funding funding has come up, and we'll, we're going to continue to have that conversation about making sure they have the funding, but I believe the plan is to continue to do the space operation the way we did and that the other services will be delivered, uh, continuing some work from home options. Jeff, do I have that right in my head? Yes, sir, you do. So, okay. so Kent, like, I don't everything. know if that'll be the case in two years or three years, but for this coming year, it will work like it did last year and we will, the space um, will, be, will be provided and given to the election uh, operation as priority. It was a nice setup, and two years I may be retired from that. So <laughs> I don't know. Second question is: At the impact meeting uh, last week, I believe it was Thursday or something, Tuesday. I don't remember. Something was mentioned about the county giving to impact uh, to the affordable housing five million dollars. Uh, so, as part of the housing policy, there's a trust fund that's going to be one of the priorities for that. And the a trust fund is designed to hold money in it that you can use specifically for affordable housing items. But then that money can be used to start earning against itself, et cetera. So their request specifically was asking if we can get $5 million into that fund and then they want to see $5 million go into it annually. Um, as I now that forum doesn't allow for a lot of conversation or discussion about it. Um, so the answer was yes, would I be supportive of that? I would be supportive of getting $5 million annually into that fund. Um, whether that continues to happen for 20 or 30 years, um, I think that's a different conversation that we've yet to have. Um, but the money wouldn't necessarily be all public dollars either. There's other ways for monies to get into that fund. And um, in conversations with impact, because a lot of times you have one-on-ones with their group prior to that yes or no support meeting, um, that I have certainly, they and I have talked about other ways that money can get in there. So I think if somebody asked the, the committee that's working with impact on affordable housing, do you expect all of that money to just be public dollars coming from your general fund or through your, um, you know, from the county? I don't think they'd say yes to that. I think that they have creative ideas of how other monies could go in there. Initially, it'll be heavier on, uh, on public monies going in but down the road, if you have a substantial fund and it can start earning against itself, then you can start uh, seeing those monies not needing to come from the um, from the public realm quite as high. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. We have uh, Mr. Springett. 
I'll bring him up. John, we've got the we've got Dunlora representing tonight. Oh, How are you, sir? We love you, Ned. That's <laughs> Ned, I've got two questions. One, one is budgetary in nature, and the other is uh, about a topic that already has been discussed, but it's a different question. Uh, the first on the budgetary thing, internal in the, in the budget, is there an allocation of money uh, for this year that we expect or have already received from the federal government that is, or state government, however the money would get here, that solves our budget problem this year, uh, but would not necessarily be available next year. So that we, you know, we, we're, we're fine this year, but uh, I don't know that more money will be given uh, in, in the future. Is that a clear, clear enough question? Well, we're going to find out because if I if, if my answer is not clear enough, then, <laughs> then I may not have understood. I can tell you that the approach from the start of the pandemic, and I give all credit to staff for this, is they went back when we redid the budget last year, and we you've heard, I know you've heard because you you, got, you follow along, um, the three six six approach. So when we decided, or when staff decided, and the board agreed to deal with the issues related to the pandemic to our budget, it was not to rely on or um, expect any help from the state or the federal government. So things were frozen, reserves were frozen, money was put aside so that we can weather the storm and we did it instead three months, six months, six months. Um, that was all done very specifically so that we can do check-ins and make decisions based on that. Now, during that time frame, monies became available in the first round. And now, right now, we're in the midst of learning what the second round is about. So, specifically to the current year, because that first round came about, it allowed monies to go into reserve where we could backfill where we would have spent the money. It just, we don't, you know, the local dollars didn't have to go there. The, the federal dollars are um, backing that in. So I think, yes, we're fine for the current year. Some of the monies that we're understanding now that are coming down from in the second round can be used in the current year. And the board is in the process of making decisions on how that money is gonna be expended. There were there are quite a bit of stri uh, very strict criteria, both in the first round and the second round, and they're not necessarily the same criteria about what the monies can be used for. And that's the part that staff right now in this second round is really uh, working hard, you know, as fast as they can to understand what can this money go to. And, and today's budget session, if you want to go back and uh, if you didn't get a chance to follow along today, you can go back and watch the recording was the first layout of um, the explanation of this current uh, relief package coming through and what it means to us. And then conversation of how the board's going to look to it. It seems the second round is a little bit more infrastructure related. Um, there's definitely some economic recovery, some some uh, revenue loss type things. So, um, uh, to, to my knowledge, we're not restricted in putting that into the current year, but it's going to be spread out over the next couple of years so that we can kind of ease back into our normal state of things um, after that money is no longer available to us. I would just simply again say that that I appreciate our budget team our finance team and our county executive because they approach this as if that money is not in play, um, which means that we're going to keep ourselves in a, um, I think in a healthy stance from a, from a, uh, a budgetary standpoint so that if for something goes sideways, which I don't expect it will at this point, but if continued, if monies don't come in a third round, um, we're, we're not managing or doing any sort of decision-making thinking that it would. Um, so we're doing our best to be just to be prudent from that standpoint. Lori or Jeff, is there anything there to, to add? John, how'd I do? Did I answer your question? I did really well. Uh, I, I mean, I just wouldn't want to take that money that, and use it for other than one time things. Otherwise, uh, we would end up in a hole that, that the next year, maybe deeper than we want. Yeah, there were some there were some positions like, and, I, and I made this made this comment earlier and Supervisor McKeel did as well. In the current budget, 
we're funding these fire positions initially from some grant money, but we're doing it with the full understanding that that's going to be an ongoing annual operational cost after the grant, the initial grant funding runs out. So my point this afternoon was that if, if, if we were to do anything with this money that's specific to an ongoing cost, a position, then we need to have the same type of discourse that we do with these fire positions, knowing full well what the ramifications are in year two or year three or year four. I would not be interested in, unless it was a very specific type of task, having some sort of term limited position. Whereas we hire somebody for a year and then we don't have the money and we no longer have that position. If it, if it was a type of job that you only need 12 months of work from, then maybe, but there's not a lot of positions like that in, in county government um, that can't be filled in other ways. But point taken, and I believe you have a board that agrees with you on that one. Great, thank you. The, the other question I have is back to our, our wonderful topic of where Park, the Wetzel property. I understand that has been sold uh, to uh, another developer. And if that's true, uh, if the developer intends to seek a rezoning, uh, as in any case, will they be coming through the normal rezoning process through the CAC and on, on the way up uh, when they figure out what they would like to do? Yeah, if, they would not. If a rezoning is required. Yeah, if they ask for rezoning, it'll go through that process where the application's in and then whatever the timeline is. But the CAC kind of becomes an easy place for them to do public outreach um, just because it's a set meeting and they can um, they can kind of count on having a meeting and can do it can make it easier to get people there because it's a regular meeting. The last developer did hold extra public meetings um, by request, um, which I appreciated. Um, I would hope that this developer would do the same just because of how much public interest is in that area. Um, but I don't think we're far enough along yet to know that. Um, but once an application's in and if a rezoning request is there at minimum, they'll have to meet all the public meeting requirements that are laid out in the rezoning request. Um, and then that would include, and that's prior to going to the planning commission and then ultimately the board. Well, thank you very much. This has been an informative meeting. Marcy yeah, is. I, yeah, it, along those lines, it just occurred to me um, that if we have money to extend the um, in, the um, corridor study study all the way down East Rio to the city line, that's marvelous because that's a desperately needed enlargement, actually. So would that uh, developer kind of wait to see how the corridor study comes along because it seems to me that we really need to take some of that property to make a wider boulevard. Yeah, um, and like I, I mentioned earlier, that I, there was no objection to the corridor study going in. The cost makes sense, just it would be more expensive if we did it as a complete phase two. So getting right. it moved into this current one makes the most sense. And of course, I agree. I mean, the whole point of, or many of my points at the, um, my vote on the prior Parkway Place application was because of the infrastructure and the amount of development that has already been approved and going into place. So this corridor study is step one and understanding and dealing with and trying to plan for um, the continued growth that's gonna be in the area. So I, I would hope that anybody coming forward with any application along the corridor would maybe sit tight and see what they can learn from that study before they get ahead of themselves. Very good. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Are there any other questions this evening by raise of hand or typing in the Q&A? Well, I'm not seeing any. Uh, we had a small turnout, but mighty. Um, the questions were very good. Lori, Jeff, are there, is there anything there that you guys think we should add or mention tonight that, that maybe I missed or should have stated? Lori, I'd ask you to go first if you don't mind. Do you have anything to add? No, I, I think, um, I think it, it, it shows that we've done our, our job well um, when Chair Galloway answers questions so well. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it was nice to be here tonight. I will endorse that. I cannot answer these questions if staff has not done a good job. I, I wholeheartedly agree.
Jeff, anything else there to? I don't really have anything to add. I, I like what Lori said. I think you've been thorough with your answers. Uh, I just appreciate the opportunity to be in the community and appreciate the community taking an opportunity to learn more about county government. So thank you, sir. All right, I'll do a last call. Are there any other questions or? So Judy, are you trying to ask another question maybe? I just saw the hand pop up. It isn't Judy, it's me. Yeah, oh, that's, that's actually, actually it's Kent. <laughs> well, Judy, you see who I defer to, right? Right. <laughs> you, you, you actually you know who the right. you got it right. <laughs> you know who the boss is. Uh, the, the the tax rate is eighty two and a half cents per hundred, but yet the assessments went up two point three percent. I mean, that's going to bring in a lot more money into the county coffers. Um, do you, do you expect in the future budgets, uh, the tax rates go, go perhaps down as the assessments go up? Um, I mean, this year I know specifically that with the off, it's offsetting other places where revenue, well, taxes are not coming in. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's kind of filling the gap from another area. If you're talking about a normal year when all of it maybe increases or goes up, I mean, that's, I can tell you that the way this, the current board has been looking at it has been not to raise taxes because of that increase. Um, if it gets to the point where we think, you know, if, if the tax dollars coming in are more than we, uh, more than we need, then I expect you would have a board that would have that conversation. But the, the piece on it that I would say though, um, is that, you know, we're still sitting with, uh, what is it, 18 positions frozen, a capital improvement plan projects plan that is, in my opinion, still trying to catch up from 2008 um, and a growing county that still, well, not only expects, but a lot of times demands a certain level of service and to keep pace with that growth to provide those services and to try to meet the needs from our capital standpoint. That's part of the reason why um, you're not seeing a pullback at any point. But I mean, like I said, if, if at some point that the ledger shows those dollars are more than what we need to, to effectively pull off what we're trying to pull off from our strategic plan, providing services in our capital plan, then yeah, that should be part of the conversation. Is, is the county planning for a new high school or anything being an album mall being so overcrowded now? It's not, it's not, um, no, a, a full scale high school is not the game plan with the school board. They had made the decision a few years ago to go with the center model. The newest development, I believe, will impact that conversation came up again today as part of a, it's a twofold piece, a study by the county to use the Berkmar property that's been proffered um, out on Berkmar along with a master or a site plan or a study that happened from the school division where the bus, if you back behind Albemarle High School in Lambs Lane, all the bus depot is there. And the, the idea is if some of that cleared up and went to this proffered site along with potentially some other county services that frees the space up to be used for academic options down at the Lambs Lane campus. So this is something Supervisor McKeel has been diligently working on. Um, but if you have expansion possibilities at Albemarle where the growth is, right? Monticello is designed and built for additional capacity. Western can even be expanded to. Albemarle has always been the one that's been locked that you can't really add to. But if you then add the idea that, oh, we can add capacity at Albemarle because that land's available, then I think when you look at 10 year number, the student population numbers out 10 years, even with our anticipated growth, you really don't have the support for a full scale comprehensive high school on the scale of 11, 1200 students like a Monticello or a Western. So maybe you need 400 or 600 or 800 and that probably can be achieved through their model, their center model and expansion at the current Albemarle campus, um, which is in line with their educational goals or strategic plan from, um, from the educational perspective. Um, so I, as a former school board member, I kind of look to that and, and seek that. Um, so I think they're, I, you know, I, I agree with their approach. I understand their approach with the center model. 
The place that I think the concern will be will be elementary seats. Um, the center model and how you deliver education and um, using these different centers can help with the high school population that can be a little bit more mobile and help with seats day in and day out. The same can't be said for elementary seats, especially in our urban ring. So as 29 North Corridor continues to grow, um, you know, you're going to see Woodbrook, which just got the expansion. That's going to fill up quick. Baker Butler's already at capacity. Hollymead's at capacity. Greer and Agner Hurt, or uh, Greer's over, I believe. Agner Hurt's knocking on the door of capacity, and it just got an expansion. So these are the things that in the capital project that, um, you know, Greer got expanded in 2010-11, and it, that project got scaled back because of the economy. And we're still playing catch up from that decision. If they would have built Greer out the way that they did, the whole elementary school seat capacity in the entire urban ring would be, I think we'd still be trending somewhere, but we wouldn't be hitting capacity in these other schools as fast as we are now. So that's going to be what I think they have to start looking to. They're going to get Crozet figured out in the next round. Um, Mountain View needs additional seats, but then they're going to have to look back up north here because Broadus Wood isn't going to be the outlet for them. We're going to need some more seats up north, and that could mean a new elementary school at some point. But that's me just prognosticating in the next 5 to 10, 15 years, something like that. Talking about capital improvements, are those talk about moving KTEC out to PVCC at one time? Is that still on the table? or? I don't know. I don't know on that one, Kent. Um, I, I just I don't know on that one. I have not... Uh, I haven't been involved in any conversations about that uh, for a couple of years, so I don't I don't know where we stand, or um, I just don't know. I know. Okay. Um, along the lines, you do, you have mentioned a lot of the elementary schools in the uh, twenty nine North area. What about the middle schools? Has that been addressed? Because we we've, we've got um, uh, Sutherland, or I don't know if they've renamed it yet. Um, and Jewett. So all those kids from elementary school have to go to a middle school. Well, the weird part is watching now watching these numbers over the years is it tends to be you get kids that stay in the public system up through four or five. You get some exploration in the middle school years where they might go to a different piece, then they come back together in high school. Um, Right now, they all, for whatever reason, the middle school seats, I don't believe there are any capacity issues at Burley, Sutherland, or Jack Jewett. In fact, I think Jack Jewett has some capacity. So it's just this weird trend where you've got all those elementary school kids. Um, part of the reason why um, you've got split feeder patterns at Burley and uh, I guess Jewett's not, and I guess Sutherland's not. So it's part of the middle school population that would typically, you might think just go to Albemarle goes to Monticello, but um, and Walton's got a ton of capacity. So the only middle school that's really bumping up against its uh, its capacity or over it is out um, is um, Henley out in, in the western part. But um, I don't know if it has to do with how many kids are in first grade and how it bubbles through. But even when I was on the school board years ago, I always knew that middle school just doesn't seem to have to deal with that same number. It kind of scales back a little bit and then it'll bubble back up and in high school, but you also have kids that maybe go to a different piece and don't return for high school, or some that only don't enter system until they are in high school for sports or athletics or other pieces. So, yeah, the, the homeschoolers that yeah. might choose to do that. Okay, thanks. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions tonight? I always know I'm going to get good questions with the participants here. Well, I appreciate you all coming on. If there are questions that pop up, you can always email uh, email me. That's um, you know that's on the website on our board of supervisors page. Uh, it's just first initial last name at albemarle.org. Happy to answer questions at any given time. And if you feel strongly or have strong points about the budget, then make sure you see our budget calendar and come out during public hearing and speak your mind there. We didn't have anybody speak at our first public hearing which was a little unexpected. So I would encourage if you have, like I said, if you have opinions about it, to please be sure to participate in our upcoming public hearings. How, how many people did we end up with? It uh, looks like five. Oh, uh, half the number I <laughs> <laughs> Who got the over under on that bit? Uh, <laughs> so 
Um, but I do appreciate the participation and um, yeah. And then, like I said, if there's ever comments or opinions, just reach out to me via email and um, I'll be with Zoom. It makes doing these kind of meetings easier. So after budget, uh, maybe I'll have a couple more town halls and we can talk about some things outside of budget. But okay, well, staff, I really appreciate staff being here tonight, taking the extra time uh, to back me up and to uh, provide the Zoom and the platform. So thank you to Lori, uh, to Emily, and to Jeff. I really appreciate you putting the time in. All right, everyone. I hope everybody has a good night. Be safe.